Hey, all Scott here. If you like me, you need coffee. Lots of it. And you probably prefer it taste good, too. Well, let me tell you about Darren's Coffee Company at DarrensCoffee.com. Darren Marion is a natural entrepreneur who decided to leave his corporate job and strike out on his own, making great coffee. And Darren's Coffee is now delivering right to your door. Darren gets his beans direct from farmers around the world. All specialty, premium grade, with no filler. Hey, the man just wants everyone to have a chance to taste this great coffee. Darren's Coffee. Order now at DarrensCoffee.com. Use promo code SCOTT and save $2. DarrensCoffee.com. All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton, and this is my show, Scott Horton Show. As promised, I'll have more clips from that Bill Crystal interview of Dick Cheney on the show today. Coming up here in just a little while. First, we're going to talk with our buddy Eric Margulies on the Skype here. Hey, Eric, how are you doing? I'm just fine, Scott. We're uh, following all kinds of news everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it's blown up all over the place. So, first of all, let me tell the people about you for a minute. Eric Margulies, why, he's a war reporter for decades and decades, and uh, he wrote the book on it, War at the Top of the World, and also American Raj, Liberation or Domination. And uh, he writes a regular column you can find at ericmargulies.com, as well as uns.com and lourockwell.com. And... Uh, no, really, he's an expert in just about everything interesting. Let's start, of course, with uh, what's going on, the latest uh, of the breaking news from Ottawa, Canada, where there's some form of attack on the Parliament building there. I'll let you describe it from there, uh, Eric. Uh, Scott, preliminary uh, reports, uh, which are still confused. Uh, this is an ongoing story right now. Uh, is that uh, one or two gunmen uh, came uh, up to the National War Memorial in front of the Parliament building in Ottawa, which is uh, Canada's uh, capital, and uh, opened fire, killed a soldier, uh, then went to the uh, front of Parliament building and uh, fired some shots in there. Uh, one of the suspects is reported to have been killed by police, or soldiers, uh, another is supposedly at large. It's a very confusing situation. Yep, and then, uh, well, so I don't know. I mean, they're just playing the same clips on Fox News of the cops standing around in front of a post office or something, I guess. They're not letting the media anywhere near there. But, uh, so, you know, I don't know. Is there anything left to say? We could start speculating about who might do it and the... Uh, the new laws that are certain to be passed or whatever, if you want. Uh, well, it's, well, I'm sorry, Scott. What we can say uh, is that this follows. Two days ago, there was a very bizarre incident where a, uh, a man, a young man in Quebec who had recently converted to Islam and grown a beard, uh, ran over and killed uh, a, uh, a Canadian soldier in a parking in a in a supermarket parking lot and injured another one, uh, and he was then pursued and shot dead by the police. Uh, very odd. Uh, two days later comes this shooting in Parliament Hill. You know, uh, we Americans are used to this kind of stuff <laughs> constantly, but Canada is a very peaceful, calm, quiet country. And people are really shocked uh, that there's gunplay in their capital. Yeah, I mean, when, back when there was a plot to behead the prime minister, the whole thing was cooked up by the cops, and there never was a real threat. But this sounds like some kind of thing. I don't know. Uh, well, yeah. And now, so it could be coordinated. I'm assuming it's a uh, a political uh, Islamic type attack of any kind. Uh, to, to state it, uh, maybe clumsily and overly broadly. It could be coordinated with the thing the other day, or it could just be a copycat. Uh, you know, that's what Al Qaeda keeps saying is, hey, lone wolf's out there. Do something and throw these people into chaos. It sure doesn't take much. Well, I don't find this surprising at all. The, uh, conservative Canadian government, Prime Minister Harper, uh, whose core supporters are evangelical Christian fundamentalists out in the West, uh, sort of the mirror image of the U.S. Republican Party, ha have made it part of their party's platform to antagonize the Muslim world. Uh, the prime minister said he was very sorry that he didn't wasn't able to get Canada into the first Iraq war, but now he's doing it again because Canada just dispatched six 
warplanes to go and bomb ISIS or whoever in Syria and Iraq, and the government has adopted a very, very hostile policy towards uh, Muslims in general, uh, appealing to special interests in Canada. This is for domestic politics. But uh, these special interests mean the Israel lobby and the cops or anybody else? Uh, Yes, to uh, those who are anti-Arab in nature, that is, fundamentalist uh, evangelical groups, Christian Zionists, ardent supporters of Israel. Uh, they're all, they all love Prime Minister Harper now. And meanwhile, uh, Canada, which in, you know, not long ago was liked everywhere. Canada doesn't have an enemy in the world, has now put itself into the gun sites of militant extremist terrorists, whatever you want to call them. And as I've been saying for a long time, it's only a matter of time before angry people attack. But what we're looking at today and before is not some kind of concerted Al-Qaeda or ISIS attack. This is obviously amateur expressions of violence. Right. Um, well, and now they have been occupying Afghanistan with us all this time, right? Just not the Iraq That's war? That's correct. Just yeah. not Iraq, but uh, very happy to get into the Afghan war. Spent $20 billion dollars. Uh, lost, I don't know, over 100 men and achieved absolutely nothing. Right. Well, and yeah, again, it, as you say, amateur type uh, one-off attacks, but still it doesn't take much. And I think Fox News said that they were actually in the middle of debating a new anti-terrorism law. So, you know, the kooks are going to go howling mad about that. But, uh, you know, false flag this and that. But it just goes to show that <laughs> There's certainly no doubt they're going to pass it now. <laughs> Maybe and, even and a much worse one. Canada has a very bad app. Canada is a wonderful country. It's the Switzerland of North America. It's sensible, it's moderate, it's respected around the world. But it has a bad habit of copying the worst habits of the United States. And one of them is joining the, uh, and the terrorism hysteria uh, you know, well, if the Americans are doing it, we've got to do it, too. And so now they have it. Yeah, too bad. All right. Now, so let me ask you about this. Oh, man, I meant to have this email pulled up here. I got an email. Uh, hell, I won't be able to find it on the fly. But I got an email from a Swedish listener saying, hey, Scott, man, what is going on with the Russian bombers over Swedish airspace lately? It's kind of freaking me out. What does Sweden do? And, you know, what role, what has America gotten us into over here? And I hadn't even heard about that on the news at all. But I have heard, you know, there's this controversy over what the Swedes say is a Russian uh, submarine. Uh, and they're even threatening to drop uh, depth charges on it while the Russians are denying that it's even Russian at all. They blamed it on the Dutch, which said, you got to be kidding us. And so what in the hell is going on there? Well, I find it most amusing and enjoyable as a story. Oh, good. Nice, well, nice that change, makes me feel a little better. A nice change away from the Middle East. Uh, I'm an old Cold Warrior. I even have a certificate on my wall uh, signed by Donald Rumsfeld attesting to my service as a Cold Warrior. Yeah. War. So this kind of stuff makes me very happy. I have a, a breath of youth coming back to me because this is a typical Cold War thing. You know, the Baltic is a very narrow, shallow sea. And uh, on one side is Sweden, and on the other side is Russia and the Baltic states. And uh, there's a lot of submarine activity in the area. So the Swedish, outside of Stockholm, the Swedish, the archipelago, there uh, is uh, hundreds or thousands of tiny little islands. Great place to hide, very hard to navigate. Um, so the Russians routinely have sent vessels through there, and submarines through there, just the way we Americans fly over all kinds of countries' borders without permission. Uh, but uh, the Swedes are up in arms because they there's a pandemonium in Sweden. They only spend only 1.5 percent on defense. Uh, their once pretty good defenses have been worn way way down. And they don't even have an anti-submarine helicopter to try and locate this ship. So as far as the Swedes are concerned, they're lucky if they don't find the submarine. Because <laughs> if they do find it, they may have to 
drop death charges or something like yeah, that. Try to do something about it, yeah. The Russians really angry. All right, well, hold it right there. We got to take this dang break. We'll be right back, everybody, with Eric Margulies in just a minute. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here for the Future of Freedom, the monthly journal of the Future of Freedom Foundation. Edited by libertarian purist Sheldon Richmond, the Future of Freedom brings you the best of our movement, featuring articles by Richmond, Jacob Hornberger, James Bovard, and many more. The Future of Freedom stands for peace and liberty and against our criminal world empire and Leviathan state. Subscribe today. It's just $25 per year for the back pocket size print edition, 15 per year to read it online. That's the Future of Freedom at fff.org slash subscribe. Peace and freedom. Thank you. All right, you guys. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, Scott Horton Show. I'm talking with Eric Margulies. And uh, I don't really have any breaking news on the uh, Canadian shooting right now. Either the others never existed, or they got away, or they're hiding somewhere and the cops are too afraid to go after them. Uh, maybe that you know they're cornered, holed up in a room somewhere. And so everybody's just waiting. NORAD is ready to go, they say. DEFCON a million. Uh, all right, we're on the line with Eric Margulies. And uh, speaking of DEFCON, this and that. So here's the thing. Um, this uh, The submarine thing, I see what you're saying, how this is just sort of, you know, these things happen and doesn't even necessarily mean anything. I think it's sort of the subtext of what you're getting at there. Uh, yeah, of course, there's submarines, and sometimes they cross little lines where they shouldn't, and and lots of uh, fun islands to to uh, duck and hide in, and that kind of thing, uh, which is fun if you're a submarine captain, right? I can dig all that. But what about these bomber overflights that my emailer is telling me about? That the Russians are getting right up to the line with their long-range bombers or medium, some kind of range bombers. To be a bomber, it's got to be at least medium range, right? <laughs> Instead of just a fighter. Uh, so what the hell is that about? Uh, well, what so the hell is that I about? Think, uh, it's, uh, it's a function that Russia in recent years has uh, gone from uh, no, practically no air patrols along its borders to launching a fair amount of uh, sovereignty patrols, uh, patrolling its maritime borders, too. And now with NATO, uh, suddenly with the whole issue of Ukraine and uh, NATO taking a much more uh, active stance against Russia and uh, a forward stance, too. Uh, NATO uh, is in sending fighter aircraft, U.S., Dutch, Canadian, to uh, the Baltic states, and they're flying right next to Russia. I mean, these are tiny areas, uh, a few millimeters of, uh, on the wrong side of the map, and you're in uh, on the other country's land. So it's, um, there's a lot of opportunity for provocations, for clashes, and uh, the Russians are being more active as a response to the NATO air patrols of the Baltic, all of which are totally unnecessary. Yeah, I mean, it's not like uh, even the Americans are coming, but... Uh, but so... Now, okay, so, well, there's two ways to spin it, right? I mean, from the Russian point of view, hey, they're just re-emphasizing what their borders are and this kind of thing. From the Swedish point of view, hey, you know, what the hell are you guys doing? <laughs> they're, they're, uh, I guess what you'd call in Russia's shadow there. And, uh, and from their point of view, it looks like, uh, you know, some level of threat. Is it meant to be a threat to them or is it meant to just be, uh, well, what the hell is it meant to be? Well, uh, not a threat, but, but perhaps a reminder uh, that uh, Russia is not a, uh, a paper tiger, that it has power. It's certainly a major Baltic power. And uh, and who really knows if these Russian bombers were over Swedish or Russian territory? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it was just an email comment, but I don't think there was a question about it in his mind. <laughs> Although... Uh, I did fail to find the dang thing and uh, and quote it exactly, so I hope I'm not getting it wrong here. But anyway, so listen, let me ask you about your uh, most recent article at ericmargulies.com, the real secret of Iraq's germ weapons. How is it that I didn't know this about you, that you broke the story of Iraq's germ weapons and Western participation. Now, not just chemical weapons here. I, I don't think you're claiming to be first on chemical weapons, but you're claiming to be first on discovering Western participation 
in Saddam Hussein's germ weapons program. Is that right? That's correct, Scott. It was 14 years ago when I was covering Iraq. 24, you mean? I'm sorry, 24. I'm bad with We're numbers. in the future now. Don't make me sound older. <laughs> uh, it was in uh, 1990 uh, yeah. that, uh, that I was covering Baghdad. Operation so, Desert uh, Shield. Yeah, well, this was just before uh, George Bush Sr. launched the massive bombing uh, of you. It was Bush Sr. Now, I can't, my, uh, so long ago, my memory's going. But uh, anyway, um, the this was the first U.S. major attack on Iraq. And uh, what happened was that Saddam had rounded up uh, a whole bunch of hostages, Western hostages, and among them were a group of British scientists who had been working at the Salman Pak biological plant south of Baghdad. Uh, I interviewed, I found these British scientists. Uh, they talked to me, they showed me documents. Uh, what they said was that they had been sent by Her Majesty's government and by MI6, which is British Foreign Intelligence Service, uh, they've been seconded, as the British say, to Iraq, sent to Saddam Hussein to manufacture biological weapons for his military, to what we call weaponize them. And uh, the, the actual germs themselves were primarily uh, anthrax, tularemia, uh, botulism, and plague. Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Yeah, that, plague uh, for crying out loud. Plague, and uh, it's it sounds horrible. These the raw the feeder stocks for these uh, bio weapons uh, came from the United States, from a lab in Maryland with the full approval of the U.S. Commerce Department or Agriculture, one of the others, and uh, so we shipped them the feeder stocks, uh, the British scientists were sent there uh, to turn them into weapons. And the reason was that uh, this was during the Iran-Iraq war that ended in 1988, it lasted for eight years. Uh, Saddam's Iraq had invaded Iran under uh, urging of the United States and the Saudis and the Gulf Arabs uh, because they were petrified that the Iranian revolution, which occurred in 1979, would uh, spread across the Middle East and overthrow all of our uh, vassal, oil-producing vassal states like the Saudis and the Kuwaitis. So we got Saddam to uh, invade Iran and try to overthrow the Iranian government, uh, the Islamic government. Things went awfully wrong. The Iranians rallied, they were swamping uh, Iraq with human wave attacks, and at that point it was decided, we don't know by whom, uh, that, this, that Iraq should start developing German, uh, germ weapons as well as poison gases to break the Iranian, the Iranian attacks. Man, and you know, it's so interesting that in the middle of all this demonization of the, well, in the middle of the unending uh, we're always in the midst of the unending demonization of the Iranians. Gareth Porter just published his exclusive the other day in Foreign Policy about how the Ayatollah Khomeini, the mean one, the much meaner one than Khomeini, his successor here, uh, he absolutely forbid and announced that it was a religious edict that nuclear and even chemical weapons, never even mind biological weapons, were completely banned by the religion and banned by law, by supreme law of all Iran, by his religious edict, that uh, these weapons of mass destruction are haram. And meanwhile, the Reaganites and, and the Thatcherites are perfectly happy to give germs to Saddam to use against them. It's a sordid and disgusting story, Scott, and it was, uh, I published this, uh, in the papers that I wrote for in 2000, 2001, but it never made it into, you know, the, 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 the Washington Post and the New York Times. The whole story was co covered up, as was the story of how the U.S. Uh, actively aided uh, Iraq during the Iran-Iraq war. Mm -hmm. uh, with intelligence information and money and weapons and all kinds of things. 
uh, cynical. While the U.S. was doing this, it was also allowing Israel or facilitating Israel to sell $5 billion worth of American arms to Iran. Here's another cynical story. So the Israelis and the, Iran and the Iranians who were always at scimitars drawn and they were screaming about each other and everything. Meanwhile, they were, while no one was looking under the table, they were doing this uh, billion, multi-billion dollar arms deal. Real dirty business. Yeah. In fact, uh, in that Bill Crystal Dick Cheney clip, you know, Cheney was in the house then. He helped cover it up, but it wasn't his thing. So, you know, he wasn't guilty of it specifically. And so he gives the little summary of what it was that they had done. And it's just fun to listen to in Cheney's words because he, he gets it pretty much right. He leaves out Israel <laughs> for some reason. This conversation with Bill Crystal there. Good times. All right. Well, we're out of time again. Thanks very much for your time as always, Eric. My pleasure, Scott. That's the great Eric Margulies, everybody. EricMargulies.com, Unz.com, UNZ.com, and LewRockwell.com. And we'll be right back. Hey, all Scott Horton here. It's always safe to say that one should keep at least some of your savings in precious metals as a hedge against inflation. And if this economy ever does heat back up and the banks start expanding credit, rising prices could make metals a very profitable bet. Since 1977, Roberts & Roberts Brokerage, Inc. has been helping people buy and sell gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. And they do it well. They're fast, reliable, and trusted for more than 35 years. And they take Bitcoin. Call Roberts & Roberts at 1-800-874-9760 or stop by rrbi.co. Hey, I'm Scott Horton here, and I'm so excited about Commodity Discs from CommodityDiscs.com. They're one-ounce silver pieces with a QR code engraved on the back side. Scan the code with your phone and get the instant spot price. Commodity discs are paving the way forward for the alternative currency community in America and around the world. The QR code Commodity Disc. Technology has now finally made a real free market silver currency viable. And anyone who donates $100 or more to The Scott Horton Show at scotthorton.org slash donate gets one free. That's CommodityDiscs.com. Oh, John Kerry's Mideast Peace Talks have gone nowhere. Hey, I'm Scott Horton here for the Council for the National Interest at CouncilForTheNationalInterest.org. U.S. military and financial support for Israel's permanent occupations of the West Bank and Gaza Strip is immoral, and it threatens national security by helping generate terrorist attacks against our country. And face it, it's bad for Israel, too. Without our unlimited support, they would have much more incentive to reach a lasting peace with their neighbors. It's past time for us to make our government stop making matters worse. Help support CNI at CouncilForTheNationalInterest.org. Hey, Al Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new book by Michael Swanson, The War State. In The War State, Swanson examines how Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy both expanded and fought to limit the rise of the new national security state after World War II. This nation is ever to live up to its creed of liberty and prosperity for everyone. We are going to have to abolish the empire. Know your enemy. Get The War State by Michael Swanson. It's available at your local bookstore or at Amazon.com in Kindle or in paperback. Just click the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org or thewarstate.com.